Mr. Speaker. So what? Go. <laughs> well, well, well. Mr. St you know, I thought he would have awaited at least the response of what he asked for. But he asked for it, he'll get it, Mr. Speaker. I promise you that. Mr. Speaker, let me start off by welcoming our colleague, the member for Castri Southeast. Wish him a full recovery and I want him to ensure that he takes his rest, he needs it, and that, you know, whatever work he wants to embark upon should be of a lighter load. But Mr. Speaker, I have heard, let the jackasses breathe. I have heard barking dogs. I have heard you have lost the right to speak. But today, in this August chamber, the leader of the opposition, member for Miku South, former Prime Minister, refers to a St. Lucian citizen as a non-entity. That must go down in the record books, Mr. Speaker. Referring to a St. Lucian citizen as a non-entity. And after he lost the elections, Mr. Speaker, you will remember that famous statement, my class did not support me. My class did not support me. So clearly, Mr. Speaker, we have a class issue in this country. Mr. Speaker, the way I want to, um, as my colleague from Viewfort South did, the chronology I will adopt, Mr. Speaker, is to deal first deal with his application to your good self to have me to withdraw a statement in relation to T.O.A. King. I will do that, Mr. Speaker. I will respond to a lot of what he said, which will untruths, and then I will proceed with my presentation. I'm hoping not to consume too many of your temporal resources in this chamber, as I do know, Mr. Speaker, it is the intention that we should wrap up this evening if um, we are able to do so. But Mr. Speaker, on the occasion to which the member for Miku South referred, I said and I quote, Mr. Speaker, I was barely expounding on the rubric of the necessity for due diligence. That is all. That is all I was doing. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, that CIP, CIP applicants go through Interpol and multiple due diligence processes. So I guess, Mr. Speaker, Jack Lamb, who has been celebrated at Sandals in the company of the then Prime Minister, would have passed the due diligence process. Mr. Speaker, he was being celebrated by our then Prime Minister, being in partnership with T.O.R. King, who himself is a CIP passport recipient through the CIP program. Mr. Speaker, I meant that he was a CIP passport agent. And so I was willing to amend the word recipient to agent. And Mr. Speaker, my basis for doing so, my basis rather, are twofold. First and foremost, Mr. Speaker, T.O.R. King, to whom I referred, was the one who indicated to the government that he will be building the Alpina St. Lucian Hotel and the Alpina Square in Viewfort. In that regard, Mr. Speaker, he applied and received CIP approval 
as a developer. And I'm reading, Mr. Speaker, I could make it a document of the House, what appears on T.R. King's website in relation to that resort in Viewford. He said, the Alpina St. Lucian Hotel, along with the Square, are government-approved real estate projects under the Citizenship by Investment Program of St. Lucia. So that was the basis on which I spoke that T.O. King, his development was an approved development. But I want to say this, Mr. Speaker. I want to say this. When that application was made for approval to be a CIP developer, it was disapproved by both the board and Invest St. Lucia. More than once I'm being corrected. You hearing, Mr. Speaker? But because of the high-handedness of certain persons, approval was granted. The second reason, Mr. Speaker, that I refer to T.R. King as a CIP agent is the DSH agreement, which I can make a document of the House, which was hurriedly signed, unfortunately, about six weeks after the election by the member for Miku South, now leader of the opposition, and unfortunately, the member for Swazel Saltimus. Mr. Speaker, it was signed on the 29th of July, 2016. And at the back here, I see John Bradley Phillips, Minister of Commerce and Investment. I see Tio King, and I see the framework agreement, DSH, and uh, yes, indeed. And Mr. Speaker, in substantiation of my assertion that he was a CIP agent, I will endeavor to read just a few excerpts as I don't want to bore you with what obviously is a very, very disadvantageous document insofar as the interest of St. Lucia is concerned. Mr. Speaker, let me refer to about five or six clauses very quickly. Designation and transfers of land, and today they want to talk about expenditure. The government warrants and represents that it is the sole legal owner of the land, and the land is not subject to any encumbrance, save the Viewfort land field, of which due notice has been given to the master developer on the understanding that the government undertakes to decommission, to decommission and remove the said landfill by a date to be agreed upon between the parties. One of the undertakings was the decommissioning of the landfill in Viewfort. And Mr. Speaker, it has happened. We now foot a monthly bill of about $90,000. Every month we pay $90,000 because the Minister of Finance then, and unfortunately the member for Sozel Saltibus, who hurriedly, hurriedly signed this agreement and placed us in this bind. Mr. Speaker, Clause 210, I want to read, which the member, and you know he left because he cannot take the truth. He cannot deal with the truth. And he signed it. Mr. Speaker, it says, hear this well, notwithstanding the provisions of, of this clause, the leasehold to the land identifying Exhibit 2 as designated for horse racing and if required by the, by the master developer, part of the eco-site to be used for a museum and natural attraction shall be transferred to the developer in accordance with the, with the phasing schedule for a period of 99 years in consideration for one US dollar per acre. So when he says, Mr. Speaker, that this is not true, 
This is the agreement signed by the Prime Minister then, agreeing to lease our land to T.O. King at a dollar an acre for 99 years. Now, Mr. Speaker, he refers to the land was sold for $60,000. You know, this man is a stranger to the truth, Mr. Speaker. It says here, and this well, the agreed commercial rates as stated in clauses 2.7 and 2.8 shall only apply, only apply if they want to commercialize part of the eco, eco side. So when he says some of the land was sold, Mr. Speaker, that is not true. That is a blatant lie. But Mr. Speaker, you know, hear this. The government, and he spoke about the CIP legislation. Mr. Speaker, when the last administration assumed office under the law, they were duty bound to come to parliament for approval of expenditure of CIP funds. They were bound to come to parliament to get the approval. What did he do, Mr. Speaker? He came in here and he changed the legislation. He changed it. So parliamentary approval was no longer necessary. But oh, not only for that he changed it, Mr. Speaker. He undertook to change it for T.R. King as well. The government undertakes to do the following in relation to the CIP. To amend the regulations to include investment in a mixed-use tourism enterprise for real estate development, recreation, to amend with respect to the removal of any limitation on applications for passports. All of that, Mr. Speaker. But the most vexing one, Mr. Speaker, is the escrow account. The escrow account, Mr. Speaker, and I'm hoping, Mr. Speaker, that those kinds of disadvantages imposed on our people by the gentleman, Mr. Speaker, shall never come to pass, but we don't even know. So when he opens his mouth and he says, Mr. Speaker, that government monies were not spent on horses, let me read clause 7 to you. Because up to now we have no accounting in that regard. The master developer shall open a new bank account in his own name. Tiwa King will open an account in his own name in a banking institution outside of St. Lucia. Are you hearing? Are you all hearing St. Lucians? When he tells you a certain talk show host turn minister, tell him stay there. Ask him to stay there. Because the I believe in documents. And Bradley sadly said that, I don't know if he wants me to read the buy, buy, buy back clause to him, but I wouldn't. I'll spare you today. I'll spare you. I'm, I'm not rich there. I'm, you want me to read it? Hold on. Member for Swazil. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if, yeah, I, think, I think I'm sending on a point about it, but I believe there's. You think? The member is misleading. <laughs> and I'll tell you why, Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you why. The member is, is, is reading from an original document, and there have been two, there were two subsequent documents after this one, of which I was not a signature. Where, no, no, no. Of which I was not a signature. To which you were not a signature? Of which I was not a signature. Okay, so no, no. That's no. why I'm saying. Um, the original document you're reading, you're reading from there, it was a signatory, but there have been two, there were two updated documents mm -hmm. which was signed that I was not part of it. So they, there may be other components, <laughs> for example, the buyback clause was one of those that was addressed um, in, in, in the updates. But I've done the member for Castries Central, are you reading from the document which carries His the signature. member for Suzanne's so signature? That's correct. Please proceed. That's correct. That's what I'm reading from. Escrow account. The master developer shall open a new bank account in his own name, outside St. Lucia. The monies received for the investment of CIP participants shall be deposited into that account. It goes on. 
the master developer shall use the monies to satisfy any project related fees cost and at least he could basically do almost anything with that money Mr. Speaker almost anything and the government has no access to that to those monies prior to each withdrawal by the master developer from the escrow account the master developer shall send a written notice to the government and state the amount to be withdrawn the date to be withdrawn <laughs> oh lord and why it is to be withdrawn and the withdrawal shall go if the bank is not in receipt of any valid reason objecting the, 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 the government to the withdrawal but <laughs> mr speaker hear this at 7 4. following the completion of following the completion any funds remaining in the escrow account shall belong to the master developer and the withdrawal process shall no longer apply you know this is what this is what this man subjected us to mr speaker and today today you come in here pontificating as though you are jesus christ of finance you're not mr speaker i want to talk briefly on some of the points which in my view made no sense which in my view made no sense he spoke in relation to excise taxes but he lumped everything up mr speaker and then he realized that the government had a shortfall of about 40 million dollars on petroleum he realized that now he's saying in total you got more why didn't you reduce the price of gas although they themselves on the last year collected 45 million this government collected 25 a shortfall of 40 but he still wants the government to reduce it to reduce it further what kind of prudent governance would that be mr speaker the other thing is you may get one more revenue on one end but it does not mean the other sources of funding came to fruition you have grants suppose you did not get the grants budgeted for so you have a hundred million dollars on the grants to balance your budget it did not come through because you have no control over grant funding and when it is received but you make 50 million more on fuel and you should reduce the price of fuel not realizing that grant funding didn't come to pass so you understand why we're in the mess we are mr speaker you understand the other thing is he must understand that they may just have been commensurate expenditure with the increased revenue you know and the man say he has a mixed degree mixed degree i don't know in what i don't know in what mr speaker when you still sit here and you hear a man who was minister of finance adding deficits for a five-year period it tells you we were in a serious problem we were in a serious problem you start off with a Z deficit and you continue for the rest of the financial year the man is adding deficits and subtracting deficits you know i i don't understand where they got him from where they got this man from i don't know you know and then talk about they lost a lot of revenue i'll address that mr speaker because in my substantive address i have that but you know when you tell me when you tell me and that same man speaks about traveling the audacity of this man this the member for miku south is on record as being having the greatest bill the most expensive travel bill both as a minister and a prime minister the, I'll, I'll repeat that the most expensive travel bill by any minister in the history of this country is by him when he was minister of tourism 
and the most expensive bill as a prime minister is by him when he was prime minister. You, you, oh, oh, the 2,000 pounds a night in England. Have a vehicle idling whole day, whole night, telling his drivers that he could walk out at any time and the vehicle must be cold. You didn't realize those had financial consequences. The man was traveling so much, he was following me and Motley like what a put no, not a put I don't want to say that here. You know? <laughs> following me and Motley all over the place. In fact, Mr. Speaker, be a motley delivered the feature address at the 16th, what was it? Uh, something in Sweden, Mr. Speaker. And he was the only prime minister in the audience. He just decided he'd follow Mia. There was a meeting, I still have the clip, where Mia was delivering and he's, he's dropping on her notes and the Belgian pulled the notes. You know, that's a fact. <laughs> he, he traveled. Mia Motley was doing a delivery. He deliberately sat himself in a, in a place where he could have taken advantage of seeing her notes. And when one of the attaches saw that, they pulled the notes away from his, his line of, of, of sight. You know, this is what the man does. The man believes he is like those persons who fall in a certain bracket, like the member for, for Viewfort South. You know, so some of them, Mr. Speaker, he, oh, I'll deliver the land after. I don't, I just, honestly, Mr. Speaker, I am really, really, I believe that for every lie, it can be found that a member tells, once it can be substantiated, he should be suspended for one session. Because I know the member for Miku South would have had so many lies cumulatively that he would not be here for another five years. I mean, it's sickening, Mr. Speaker, to sit and listen. Let me talk about consultancies, Mr. Speaker. Consultancies. You were given to run this country as Minister of Finance. The very first thing you do is to bring in consultants. You brought in consultants in Ernst & Young to do what civil servants always did and then tell solutions without disclosing the right amount, it cost about 1%. We had, a, we had a transition team to take us from Victoria Hospital to OKEU, headed by Dr. King, humble son of the soil. You discarded them and brought in a team from India as consultants, paying them in excess of $1 million a month. Yes, it was, it was nine point something million, so it came to 25 million EC. You know, Mr. Speaker, and the list goes on and on and on. But as I deal, as I go through my, my thing, Mr. Speaker, I will deal with some of the assertions that he made. Mr. Speaker, let me, although I mentioned them earlier, I want to thank the civil servants of this country, in particular those who were responsible for crunching those numbers together. I think we deserve to give them a round of applause because they have done a fantastic job. So we have started off with savings, Mr. Speaker. We have started off this with savings. We are paying no consultant. We take the advice of our technocrats who are equipped with the relevant expertise to guide us in the right direction. I want to take this opportunity as well, Mr. Speaker, to give the nod to the estimates. Estimates which increase the allocation to each and every ministry taking cognizance of increased demands placed on the backs of every MP. Mr. Speaker, 2022-2023 was a relatively challenging year for almost every ministry. We at 
Ministry of Housing and Local Government. We had challenges, but we tried. We tried, Mr. Speaker. Because you see, the fact of the matter remains that no district rep, no minister, not even the Minister of Finance, can discharge each and every demand that is made of him. Before I delve into my particular ministry and cons constituency, Mr. Speaker, I want to give St. Lucians an overall view of the performance of this government that, thus far, given the scarcity of resources and the very sad, the sad financial state in which this great country of ours found itself. Mr. Speaker, same sad state of affairs is putting it mildly, extremely mildly. But I don't think there is any word within any dictionarial, dictionarial compartment that would aptly describe what this country had been through between 2016 and 2021. This country was being run by a brainless, a clueless, an ill-advised Minister of Finance and decisions taken on behalf of the, of the people of this country were not in their best interest. Mr. Speaker, had we continued with the trend that we inherited, St. Lucia would have been sold by now to the highest bidder. But the good Lord intervened and rescued this country from the callousness and the squandering of its scarce resources. But the financial and economic environment is now beginning to change. And St. Lucia looks better. You know, when you have the member of Miku South being audacious enough to say that nothing is happening, Mr. Speaker, I wonder what he calls something. I wonder if he's giving Tiwa King land at a dollar an acre, something he denies at every given opportunity. I wonder if he's giving DLCs to his friends. I wonder if he's acquiring property and then having persons in his immediate circle to handle its development. I remember Mr. Speaker blowing the whistle on Weepe. And I thank God I did. Because had Weepe been here, Mr. Speaker, what it would have done was every transaction with government would have gone through them and they would have gotten a percentage of the transaction. But then, Mr. Speaker, I did my investigations and I found brother-in-law and father-in-law and this-in-law and that-in-law involved and I blew the whistle, Mr. Speaker, and there was immediate resignation of all the persons who were members of WIPI, members of the board of WIPI. So we are doing well, Mr. Speaker. We are on a better trajectory as can be gleaned from the estimates. Mr. Speaker, it was projected that this financial year we would have collected one point. And you see, you see, Mr. Speaker, now hear the hypocrisy. Hear the hypocrisy. He speaks about fuel or excise taxes. Excise taxes increased. Fuel, there was a, a, a deficit. But the overall revenue position of the government, what projected and the actual was less. So the government projected to have collected $1.327 billion. We collected $1.303. He will not talk about those figures at all because it will not justify the narrative that he wants to push. Our revenue fell. Our total revenue fell even if aspects of the revenue increased. Is the total revenue. But then again, he's pontificating and trying to fool the 43 percenters. Let me say that in part one. Let's say, please, yeah. Les leaders of opposition ne cadou nous fait plus la halle gas et nous te sabe ces gas. Les gouvernements ka met tout l'argent ensemble. 
yo ka joini from various côtés Adabele, yo kote fe pli men perse les ot, bat lot kote a, if i fe pli wos pase lot la. A total, sa nou te ka expect nou te ka fe, nou pa fe. Me sa yi ka fe, jos pou kwenye moun do a la, i pwen yon set bagay selman. I pwen yon set bagay ek i blie tout lesta. Our revenue fell. That's what? It is the surplus on excise taxes. But Mr. Speaker, the reality is, the fact is, we lost revenue. There was a revenue deficit of 20, 24 million dollars. You know what is, what is not, not noteworthy, Mr. Speaker, is that the government exceeded it did not exceed, sorry, but that revenue shortfall was directly contingent to grants. So whilst we make money on excises, on excise taxes, the totality of the revenue, excise taxes is just one component. Another component is grants. And grants fell. It is no fault of ours. If a man tells you he'll give you $100 million and you budget for it as per your estimates, then invariably, you will see that there was a revenue shortfall. So, Mr. Speaker, another thing I want to see is that a lot of persons believe they be your turn budget passy, they believe there is a windfall of cash. Mr. Speaker, one of the I always say that at all my presentations, that this is not so. The estimates of expenditure are directly contingent upon the receipt of the various sources of funding earmarked from a given head of, 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 of uh, revenue. So, Mr. Speaker, you can have estimates. You can say you are building an airport and your revenue source is a grant. If the grant does not come through, you cannot build the airport. And that is the harsh reality. Mr. Speaker, for the financial year 2020-2023, we had total expenditure estimated at $1.42 billion. But through proper management, prudential management, there was a budget surplus of $29 million. And it did not happen by accident. It did not happen by accident. When a senior civil servant can openly say in the presence of colleagues that the country is now experiencing better financial management, you know implicitly that is a way of saying that this Minister of Finance in the member for Castries East is doing a much better job than his predecessor. You see, Mr. Speaker, the civil servants had become accustomed of being given instructions to spend what we did not have, far less what we had. When we inherited the governance of this country, the GDP for 2021-2022 was $4.9 billion. For those who may not know what GDP is, it is the gross domestic product and it is the value of all goods and services produced in your country for a financial year. Mr. Speaker, this is the culmination of our first financial year, totally driven by us. Previous one, we were partly responsible for the curve that began happening. This financial year, 2022-2023, is our first in full control of what is happening within the corridors of government. Mr. Speaker, what is telling is that last year, our GDP was $4.9 million, and this year, for the year 2022-2023, it was estimated to have been 5.47 billion, 
but ended up at 5.5 billion. So you understand, Mr. Speaker, why our economy did the best in the OECS, third best in the Caribbean, and the seventh best in the world. And Mr. Speaker, that is against challenging times. Challenging times. Best in the OECS, third best in the Caribbean, and seventh best in the world. You see, Mr. Speaker, on fuel, and I'll say it in part as well, Ale Gas, Gouvernement Tehameti Ale Livli, that it a kai fair second six million dollars. C'est ça été ni à l'air livré, mais il pas fait ses l'argent ça là. Il fait about vingt cinq million dollars et plus passé second pour second cinq pour cent nous pas joindre. Yet, Mr. Speaker, opposition vle nou bese pui gas toujou. Si se nom sa la teni, la te we se klisyen, an tse yo, person pa kamado, konte ha budget, pou fe kalte la han sa la, ou fe about 45% ou sa ou te ka expect, yo stil vle ou bese pui gas. Now, Mr. Speaker, I heard the member from Swazel, Salty Bus, speak about revenue shortfall and they keep blaming COVID Mr. Speaker there is no doubt that COVID affected all of us COVID affected all countries in the global village but Mr. Speaker the situation was exacerbated by bad policy decisions extremely bad policy decisions when you tell me Mr. Speaker that you are reducing VAT from 15% to 12.5% causing the government to lose cumulatively about $275 million in five years, roughly $55 million a year. What do you think you're doing? What do you think you're doing? And you blame COVID for that? When you tell me you can decommission the rubbish dump in view fort and then pay ninety thousand dollars every month to transport garbage from view fort to the deglo dump you didn't exacerbate the situation when you tell me mr speaker you can spend 112 million dollars on horses you didn't exacerbate the situation when you tell me you could give Lockerbie a consultancy of 32 million dollars you didn't exacerbate the situation. When you tell me a hotel that had registered debt of $135 million, government is not a hotelier, yet you use your powers of compulsory acquisition to acquire it. You didn't exacerbate the situation. Permandu, $13 million. And all of those things, Mr. Speaker, I have a list here. I have a list, hotel 2,000 pounds a night. And you're telling me you want to blame COVID for everything? You know, that's, that cannot be so, Mr. Speaker. You build a bypass road that was totally unnecessary for T.O.R. King. That cost some $15 million. And then blame COVID. In the middle of COVID, Mr. Speaker, when the St. Lucians were out of work, when people needed something to eat, when persons did not know where the next meal is coming from, you are busy signing a consultancy of over a million dollars a month, and you're blaming COVID for revenue shortfall, and to do what, to write press releases among other things, you know? That is the kind of financial mismanagement that this country was forced to go to under the last Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, you know? I mean, those blatantly outrageous financial decisions, Mr. Speaker, would always put us in the red. You know, Pobandu came down here and they just collected several 
research papers that have been done by different agencies, compile them, and give you a bill of $13 million. 13, you know, you won the election. You say you having, you went to training by Dr. Bat. You know, you are training cabinet members and put them at Coco Palm. And you talk about revenue shortfall. Now, Mr. Speaker, he spoke about the Dye Mall. And I am tired, I've gone. Uh, you know, I have rarely spoken on the Dye Mall, Mr. Speaker. But in a nutshell, I want to see this. In a nutshell. Mr. Speaker, the Dye Mall was bought when the member for Mikud, for Castries North was Prime Minister. The Dye Mall, the meeting was held at Kokopam, where members of cabinet were treated with free chicken and rum. I can say boldly, I did not participate. But the decision was taken to buy the mall for $30 million. We were paying interest of $252 million a month. Although the mall stayed idle for in excess of 12 years, for 11 years the total interest payments amounted to some $33 million. So cumulatively, government spent in excess of $63 million on the diamond. He turns around, sells it, for 13 and a half million dollars and on top of that agreeing to rent for a million dollars a month Mr. Speaker and you know not realizing that he will be putting civil servants through the walls of the northern traffic which invariably would lead to decreased productivity you know you know I mean, come on, what are you doing, man? And then today, you want to pretend that you know it all, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm tired of saying, listen, listen, the man sold the mall. He sold the entire mall. The deed of sale is here. And, the, the, you know, the other thing is the, the development agreement. You have a development agreement signed with Amazona, but it predates... The, it predates the, the, the execution of the deed, which means basically that if you're saying I'm doing a development agreement, you ought to have title to the property. Title came after. <laughs> you know, and that is how they did their thing, Mr. Speaker. That is how they did it. And, but today, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased. I am pleased because my Prime Minister was worried. The member for, me, for, for Castries East was worried. Gentlemen, we have commitments to the courts. I am happy the leader of the opposition said it's not signed. But they are putting pressure on the government, saying that they had to order special furniture, special glass, special this, special that, and we should proceed. A million dollars a month. In one respect for 16 and a half years, and in the other, 15 years. So, Mr. Speaker, and that is the same man, that is the same man having won the elections in 2016 when they ask him about the, 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 the deal with T.R. King. He said, and I quote him, I have said it several times, he said the country is broke. The country is broke. You met a broke country but you bleeding it like that? Mr. Speaker, during the financial year 2022-2023, under the rationalization program, regularization, sorry, 250 lots were marked to have been created. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to report that in regards to the PROUD program, we exceeded the expectations and some 328 lots were created. But I must pause here to say, Mr. Speaker, that for the financial year 2021-2022, not one lot was created for any solution. Not one. 
So we moved from zero to 328 at the end of this financial year. So we are heading in the right direction, Mr. Speaker. And as a member for, Miku, for Viewfort South quite rightly said, we have over a thousand lots currently being surveyed and when they are ready for sale, one of the things I undertake to do is to contact the relevant district representatives so that they could partner with us to ensure that the people are the ones who, the people of the areas are the ones who benefit from those lots. Because what you find, Mr. Speaker, Adam Unpakawiti Adakuti, Mile Proud Vinyek, because you can buy there at Opui, Kiwezona. And so they converge on the areas ready for sale, much to the disadvantage of persons who are in need. Only about two weeks ago, Mr. Speaker, right at the Castri City Council, your humble servant has built 17 deeds of sale to various St. Lucians, giving them title to land under this government. 17, Mr. Speaker. And this is how you empower people. I remember one of the ladies who received it, it says, Mr. Frederick, now I can mortgage my land and buy a Rolls Royce. <laughs> I guess she was expressing how happy she felt at the time. Mr. Speaker, but as the member for Viewfort South quite rightly said, land ownership and title to land is empowerment. It is empowerment. You can use it for personal development, you can use it for the development of your children, and you can use it for the educational needs of your children. And so, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you last week, I saw some bright smiles on those 17 persons whom I had given the deeds, all of it happening under the watch of your humble servant since I assumed office. Mr. Speaker, I am now corrected because I thought it was the first time in history that we had the National Housing Development Program. And it is one, Mr. Speaker, that was introduced to take care of the poor, the vulnerable, and those in the lower income bracket. Mr. Speaker, notwithstanding the noise that you hear, only one million U.S. dollars have been expended in that regard. With that amount, Mr. Speaker, over 200 households have benefited from minor to major repairs or to even total construction of houses. 200 island wide. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that for this financial year 2023-2024, we shall roll out twice that amount in the sum of $5.2 million to assist the poor and vulnerable. We are expecting, Mr. Speaker, to assist a further 1,000 households. We are expecting to assist another 1,000 households. Mr. Cemeteries, Mr. Speaker, cemeteries in this country is a sore point. And sometimes I don't even want to talk about cemeteries in this country. Just before Christmas, some urgent attention was needed in Viewfort. And I had to call the Minister of Finance amidst the festive season to call whoever the directors are at the Ministry of Finance to ensure that there was some urgent intervention in view forward. Mr. Speaker. Member for Castries, you have 10 minutes left. Of. No, I need, I need at least another 40 minutes, Mr. Speaker. 32 there. 40, 40. Member for Miku North. Mr. Speaker, I beg that standing order for the 210 be invoked and that the member for Castry Central be given an extra 45 minutes to complete his contribution. Honorable members, the question is that 
Standing Order 3210 be invoked to allow the member an additional 45 minutes to complete his presentation. And I'll put a question, as many as of that opinion say aye. Aye. As many as have a contrary opinion say no. If it's granted, please proceed. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, colleagues. I don't think I will consume the entire 45 minutes, Mr. Speaker. I will try to put myself into a more productive gear insofar as speed is concerned. So, Mr. Speaker, I was saying cemeteries in this country is posing a serious problem. And just before Christmas last year, Viewfort encountered an urgent situation. As it appeared, people were dying much quicker than tomb availability was. So this year, Mr. Speaker, an allocation of some $2.4 million is budgeted. And I must confess that Miku North calls for urgent, urgent assistance. They do, Mr. Speaker. The Miku Cemetery is almost filled to capacity. Monrepo is nearing exhaustion. Dairy so is a special problem. And so for that belt, Mr. Speaker, there is need to pay attention to the Monrepo Cemetery. In that regard, the land has already been acquired and we will proceed with due dispatch, lighting rapidity to ensure that we deliver on that cemetery. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the Northern Basin, Castries Constituency Council is currently undergoing a design for an upgraded cemetery to be constructed on lands already acquired in the Bexo Basin for that purpose. An allocation, Mr. Speaker, has been made of about $1.5 million, which will assist us. Mr. Speaker, local government and the constituency councils. We were given a little kakada to assist them to do their projects. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to publicly commend the city police for doing a phenomenal job. And I'm sure the Minister of Tourism would agree to that. The city police are doing a phenomenal job. I want to commend them publicly. Mr. Speaker, we have seen the escalation on the ground of a spate of robberies that occur more particularly within the city circuit, especially on days, especially on days when cruise ships are in port. And they are the ones that are more visible on the ground. They are the ones who converge on the city, and they are the ones who invariably are the, f are the persons of first encounter in so far as apprehension of perpetrators is concerned. They have made a number of arrests, Mr. Speaker, and continue to make those arrests, which serve as a deterrent to those who are criminally minded. They have been furnished with motorcycles, a further pickup, body cams, and other equipment to ensure that they execute their duties with professionalism. Mr. Speaker, although the City Council saw a relatively challenging financial year, it ensured that all workers, Mr. Speaker, were paid on time. The Castries Constituency Council has also taken medical insurance, medical coverage on all its workers. And I am particularly pleased in relation to those in the sanitation department. They are charged with the responsibility of keeping the city and its environs clean. And they, Mr. Speaker, are exposed to all those diseases that garbage may contain. But with medical insurance, we will ensure that should they unfortunately contract any disease, we, they will be taken care of. This financial year, in fact, next quarter, Mr. Speaker, Castries Constituency Council will be purchasing a small vacuum truck. We will be buying a vacuum truck, Mr. Speaker, as we know there is a need for it. We will be buying other equipment 
so that the workers can be better equipped to take care of castries north, castries south, castries east, and of course, the king itself central. Mr. Speaker, we will soon be erecting parking meters in the city. And we await this year approval. We await this year approval. As soon as we get it, I could tell you, Mr. Speaker, that it is something that we will be installing pretty, pretty soon. Like central government, the Castries Constituency Council ordered, honored rather, its triennium obligation to its workers for a salary increase and their back pay. It cost council approximately $2.5 million. Mr. Speaker, most persons don't know that Castro City Council shoulders the responsibility of paying Lucilec for the street lighting in the city and its environs. This comes with a very heavy tab of about $2.5 million annually. Mr. Speaker, in that regard, the government remains steadfast and is committed to replacing the island's street lamps with LED lights. During the policy debate, Mr. Speaker, I am sure the Prime Minister will disclose the mess he inherited in that regard. When a man who is not an electrician, who is not known to have anything to do with electrical installation, or has experience in that regard, was the point person of a $25 million contract for light installation. His sole qualification, I dare say, Mr. Speaker, was being a UWP hack. He was a hack, and in his lap, landed a $25 million contract. So, Mr. Speaker, before I get to my constituency, I want to speak a little on the National Housing Corporation. Mr. Speaker, the NLC has been in existence for in excess of 50 years, over 50 years, previously known as HUDC. Now, please permit me, Mr. Speaker, to deviate slightly. For in excess of the 50 years, Mr. Speaker, the NLC has never had its own office. Notwithstanding that this organization is involved in the development of land, the sale of developed lots, the construction and sale of houses, it has never had its own headquarters. And you know, Mr. Speaker, it appears that the organization continues to exist, just collecting rental revenue from the CDCs, selling properties, and paying salaries. Mr. Speaker, that is not sustainable, Mr. Speaker. We currently pay pretty close to $9,000 a month. Mr. Speaker, we took the decision to buy a building. But here comes the reason for digressing slightly. As it came with much propaganda that was spewed by the United Workers' Party, perpetuation of blatant untruths, and of course, some of them were repeated in this August chamber by no other than the biggest stranger to the truth, the leader of the opposition. Mr. Speaker, I will endeavor to shorten the version of events and to just remain focused on the most salient point. We identified a building to be purchased and it carried a value of $3.5 million. The entire board, and for those who don't understand what entire means, the whole board visited the building along with senior members of staff. Based on that visit, Mr. Speaker, a visit that did not secure my presence. I was not with them because I did not want them to make any judgment call that was influenced by my presence. Mr. Speaker, each and every board member, each and every staff member agreed that we should buy the building like yesterday. What was even more enticing, Mr. Speaker, 
is that notwithstanding the $3.5 million valuation, the owners were willing to sell us at an unbelievable $1.8 million. The question is why? Because government under the United Workers Party had first rented that building from the owners and government remained in occupation for some 13 years. The owners cumulatively collected about $2.1 million in rent and therefore they were willing to pass some kind of reprieve to the National Housing Corporation. So Mr. Speaker, the urge was there, but guess what? The National Housing Corporation had no money. And with the uncertain income stream, its income stream is rental revenue, and collections of difficulty sometimes, we knew that the eligibility would probably be in the balance. And the time-consuming application process may not have been necessarily in our best interest as the owners wanted urgently to close the deal. Mr. Speaker, we needed to capitalize on that opportunity with due dispatch. And so it was agreed that the National Housing Corporation would sell a property solely for the purpose of acquiring its own headquarters. And help came, Mr. Speaker, the propaganda by the United Workers' Party. And you heard, Mr. Speaker, land at Tapion, land opposite the Wellness Center, the member for Miku South and leader of the opposition, in his attempt at fooling the 43 percenters, will say land in Castries is $1,000 a square foot, so he's saying Tapio. In fact, I do have a clip, Mr. Speaker, where he says that the land there is $400 a square foot. I'm not sure how much he said today. But that is the kind of misinformation. Where in Tapio you get land for $400 a square foot? Where in Tapio you get land for $400 a square foot? And it comes, Mr. Speaker, with this fanciful exchange. He believed the men at NIC are idiots. They are not the same ones who were there under the United Workers Party who lent cab out our money. They are not the same ones. How on earth would anybody buy land up there for, for, for $400 a square foot? Nobody would even buy um, um, where people live in Fuller Show, which is worth much more in my view. That's prime property. That is prime property. But Mr. Speaker, the land is in Tapio. It is about probably half mile to three quarter mile from the port. The man says $400 a square foot. You know, Mr. Speaker, those are the kind of difficult situations that sometimes you have to debunk. You have to debunk them, but when they are spewed by someone who has a certain degree of influence, albeit on persons who cannot think for themselves, you have to be worried. You have to be worried. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the place was called La Salopui. La Salopui. You know why they call it La Salopui, Mr. Speaker? Whether through natural currents or human intervention, it has been a repository of a lot of garbage. If you go there now, all you will see at the front of us is rubbish. That is what it is. So much so they call it Le Salopui. The land is bounded to the sea partially by a cliff. It is bounded to the sea partially by a cliff. And Mr. Speaker, sometimes a given purchaser, based on his ability to militate against the natural tendencies of the land, can make of it what it never was. So you have heavy equipment, you can make, take that and do whatever you want with it. It's quite possible. But to say, to open your mouth and say the land was valued at $400. And Mr. Speaker, on the next occasion, the member for Miku South undertook to make a, a previous valuation done for that land 
as a document of the House. If not, he has to withdraw it. So, Mr. Speaker, to cut to the chase, Mr. Speaker, the board decided, look, we need our headquarters. We are taking the decision to sell a piece of land for that purpose. And Mr. Skinny Sinclair, a renowned quantity surveyor, conducted or effected the valuation, Mr. Speaker. And when we received the valuation, which was not influenced by anybody, and I'll tell you why it wasn't, <laughs> because last party that they could have they could have gotten the land for that for the same amount. Mr. Speaker, within the script, within the valuation, he recommended that Slasper be offered the property first. I asked him why he called and he said, even if the property is far and it may take another hundred years for the marina to reach there, you can still offer it to them. What did we do, Mr. Speaker? True to form, that was done and Slasper was written to and provided with a copy of the valuation. And in the letter, Slasper was told, this is the valuation, but you can make an offer. The truth is, we were not interested in who the purchaser was. We were never interested in who the purchaser was. Our sole interest was generation of the relevant financial resources to equip ourselves with our own National Housing Corporation headquarters. So anybody who had the money could have bought it. Anyone. But you hear all that kind of nonsense. And so, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I beg your pardon. Uh, and so, Mr. Deputy Speaker, we wrote Slasper, we appended a copy of the valuation, and we asked them, we said, this is the valuation. I think it was 3.2 or 3.3, I can't remember now. Um, if you are prepared to have it, make an offer. It took Slasper and the member for Castries North knows that. It took Slasper almost a year. And meanwhile, we are in abeyance. We need an office. It took Slasper almost a year to even respond. So we did not put the property on the open market. We did what the, the, the quantity surveyor asked us to do within the remits of, of reasonableness. We, if we wanted it confined, if possible, to a governmental agency. And so, Mr. Speaker, Slasper did not do anything almost a year. And we realized, Mr. Speaker, that look, there is a building we, we need. A year has elapsed, we are not hearing from Slasper. Meanwhile, Mr. Speaker, and uh, Mr. Deputy, another potential purchaser approached the board approach the board after one year of writing Slasper and furnishing them with the same valuation that was acted upon in transacting with the subsequent purchaser. Not a different valuation. So Mr. Speaker, the long and short of it is just before that deal was sealed, I took it upon my own to call the manager of Slasper. I asked him whether they were interested and he told me not at this time. And therefore, the deal was concluded, Mr. Speaker, between that other purchaser and the board. Slasper, I beg your pardon? Why you didn't buy the tea working one? <laughs> And so, Mr. Speaker, um, the deal was done. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? The property was sold. The building was purchased, Mr. Speaker. And mind you, both the ones sold and what we purchased were of comparative values. Both of them were valued at 3.5. We gave up one, got the other, and still had $900,000 left to embark upon renovation and refurbishment. If that is not good business sense, if that is not prudent management, I don't know what is. 
I don't know what is. And I can say, now we have our building, Mr. Speaker. National Housing Corporation, for the last 50 years, did not know what it was to have its own headquarters. It has its own headquarters, and the contractors, three or four contractors, we are not giving one person, three or four, to do various different things, will converge upon that building, and next three to four months, I'm hoping to invite the entire parliament, including the leader of the opposition, to the grand opening of National Housing Corporation headquarters on Shusi Road. That is what I'm going to do, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I think they better make you speaker, you know, with those common errors, you know. I'm sure the lawyers in here will tell you equity has done that which ought to be done. By me referring to you as Mr. Speaker, it depends that equity sees you as the speaker, the substantive speaker. <laughs> yes, Mr. Deputy Speaker. So this is progress. This is progress. And no matter what the naysayers say, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they will not derail this government. This government is on a progressive trend. This government is about making people better, making the institutions better, and putting the individual citizens of this country first. Not referring to them as non-entities. Non-entities. That one will resonate it will resonate. The man has run out of adjectives to insult the people of this country. When he can boldly say he didn't win the elections because his class didn't support him. His class. You know? And then refer to a solution citizen as a non entity. It's an indictment on a man who sat in the prime ministerial chair of this country once. But I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, I will do my utmost to ensure there is no repetition of that grave error, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as far as the housing development is concerned, we will be partnering with a private developer. The private developer has expressed interest, he's ready to go, he has all the relevant financial resources. We will be providing the relevant land in the various areas across the length and breadth of St. Lucia, and we will start something, some rigorous construction in this financial year. Mr. Speaker, we have to create some significant indentation of our 14,000 or thereabout housing stock shortage. We have to start something with due dispatch. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to my constituency. Mr. Speaker, I conceptualized and built the Serenity Park. It is my brainchild. It got its name through a competition between the primary schools in Castry Central. A committee was formed, Mr. Speaker, to determine who won that competition. And the person who won the competition, Mr. Speaker, was even invited. She named it, as a child, I think it was from the Avimiri School, she named it Serenity Park. We invited her, and that is what you call participation. She gave a brief remark on the opening of Serenity Park. Mr. Speaker, lo and behold, a feat of political victimization, a feat of attempting to throw me into political hibernation, they quickly renamed my park to George Mallet Serenity Park. George Mallet had nothing to do with that part. George Mallet did not even represent San Susi when he was representing Central. At the time, San Susi was part of Castries North, Northeast. He had nothing to do with it. But basically, Mr. Speaker, to permanently face my name from the political landscape of this country, they used their best endeavors to ensure that I was obliterated. But they did not know 
They were not mindful that the good Lord knows and sees it all. And there was a date called July 26, 2021, Mr. Speaker. And so I can proudly say that the abundant Serenity Park is back on track again and those of you who passed there for christmas saw the lights the park the fountain and how basically mr speaker it has reactivated interest as a place for recreation but mr speaker the name will be changed i can guarantee you that we have been awarded some 300 million 300 thousand dollars i wish it was million <laughs> we have been awarded some 300 thousand dollars mr speaker under the tourism project for the construction of an amphitheater and an ice cream parlor and pizzeria inside serenity park serenity park will be the place to be mr speaker and we are hoping to commence construction on that probably next month <laughs> over to the gardens mr speaker again whatever you see at the gardens is my brainchild i built serenity park between 2006 and 2011 i built the gardens the court in the gardens between that same time mr speaker mr speaker it is in a mess it is in a big big mess but it will be taken care of mr speaker you come down lower jeremy street i also built the jeremy street plaza i wasn't working as a minister mr pm at the time mr speaker i was on an, on an execution train and I was putting up structures left, right, and center. I built the Jeremy Street Plaza, Mr. Speaker. It was such a nice facility. I, they have now defaced it, Mr. Speaker, because I had regulations in there. The leases, Mr. Speaker, we said what we, what we said was we would not have placed three or four of the same vending um, facilities in there. So you would not have three bars or three SLOs or three barber shops. You try to have a combination of services. But Mr. Speaker, as soon as I was exiled from the political arena, the last government, the last government made a mess of it. Imagine, Mr. Speaker, you have the Jeremy Street Plaza. You have tenants downstairs, you have tenants upstairs. The last government drew lines downstairs to coincide with the areas of the booths as though they were creating parking lots. They drew lines, so from door to door, if that person up, um, shop is there, they drew lines like this. That other what? you know, nonsense. And the facade, you know, and what is worse, Mr. Speaker, they don't even do it. Who do it? Who? Sweet juice. <laughs> you know the worst thing, Mr. Speaker? The people upstairs started complaining, saying that the rent should be reduced because if the frontage of those vendors downstairs belong to them, as part of the rental, they need space upstairs too. And that is the kind of havoc that is created when you have men in positions and they fail to use their brain. And so, Mr. Speaker, at the Castries Constituency Council, plans are already been drawn, they have been drawn. We are hoping, you know, they deface the place with some old, dirty, nasty tents. And that's the reality. Rotten tents, you know, we will be fixing that place, Mr. Speaker, and we will regulate its use because we will not permit anyone to bring any tent on the facade of the Jeremy Street Plaza. I'm giving them notice now. We will make it nice. We will do something almost like what exists in Ancillary because we're using the same architect, but we don't want anyone coming if those wooden benches for persons to come and sleep at night, defecate and urinate much to the displeasure of other persons when they come to patronize the areas in that facility. So we are doing that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to publicly place on record as I am in my constituency my appreciation for my Atashi Dax novel. Mr. Speaker, we have been having a flooding problem 
on the show C. And nobody knew what was causing it. From New Village, there was a river, there is a river rather, and as long as it rains, albeit for a very short period, it floods and the water goes way down onto Jeremy Street. Mr. Speaker, I never realized that Jeremy Street in itself is a huge dream. Jeremy Street is a huge dream, and so my attache, he was instructed by persons from Ministry of Infrastructure, they remove this iron cap on the road, and he could have walked from Bairekai up to the point where he saw it was clogged. And so, Mr. Speaker, we were able to cut the road on a weekend, cut the road, remove a lot of debris, mattresses, stoves, washing machines, all sorts of things were down there. And now, Mr. Speaker, the water flows there so smoothly. I'm not saying that Jeremy Street will not flood again, but rest assured, it will not flood as quickly as it used to. And we are tackling a lot of the drains in castries to ensure that this is done. Insofar as cleanliness is concerned, Mr. Speaker, we have built a number of very well appointed garbage beans, Mr. Speaker. We built one at Lastic Hill, we built one at Bannard Hill, one in Mondido Lower, one in Mondido Upper. And I can tell you the people are pleased. Any one of you that drive Barnard Hill, you will see when you come down almost by Gomes, where persons used to throw garbage almost on the road. There is a very nice enclosure there now, Mr. Speaker. And it not only beautifies the place, but it keeps the place looking tidy because persons are disciplined enough to throw the garbage in the containers that it contains. So, Mr. Speaker, Castries Central is on a good path. I could stay here and articulate for the next two hours because I am sure, Mr. Speaker, my record speaks for itself. We have fixed the road in Rose Hill. We have fixed the road in Piaz Gap. And I want to say a special hello to Cecil and Pierre Smith. After I fixed that road, Mr. Speaker, the lady sent me a song, a western, and it goes, this one gets my vote. And she indicated to me, Mr. Speaker, that it had been in excess of 40 years that no one had seen it fit to at least effect some repairs to that road. As you go up on Marian, on, up by the Marian home, you will see a nice parrot on the facade on the wall it was done by your humble servant i remember getting a call from an ex-principal of st mary's college well that's got the call and he said to my attache i would have never voted for sarah because there is a walkway a footpath right adjoining the main road mr speaker and for years he was asking that it be repaired your humble servant came in and it was done Mr. Speaker, you go up by Compton, where a lot of friends congregate. There was a step over there built in 1970 or thereabout. I have redone it in its entirety with proper railings. Inside of Boapatat, we have done quite a bit, a lot of steps. Mondido, Black Stars, you name it, Richard Frederick has done it. So, Mr. Speaker, having said all of this, I know we are entering the echelons of knighthood, if I, <laughs> if I want to call it that. And so, I just want to end here by saying, Mr. Speaker, that I support the budget without an iota of doubt. I support it fully. And so, I am expecting in the not too distant future that the citizens of this country, especially the lesser bottles, feel the positive impact of this budget on their lives. With this said, Mr. Speaker, I take my leave.